You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. The thought of some people is, if that's the Holy Spirit, well, I don't want anything to do with that. That, That's crazy, right? I don't want that. Well, if you find yourself in that category, let me say this. This is so important. You never need to be afraid of a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. Never. You never need to be afraid of a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you ought to be afraid of actually stopping a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit works, sometimes it can be scary. Today, Pastor Ron says that we never need to be afraid of a work from the Holy Spirit, but afraid that we may stop a mighty work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is powerful and works in mysterious ways. Sometimes when we're fearful, we can stop what God's doing in our hearts. Has the Holy Spirit tried to do something through you? If you felt a tug, let God do His thing. God wants to work through you, and to do that, He uses the Holy Spirit to guide you. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 with today's edition of Large Than Life. Again, here we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 19 to the end of the chapter. And uh, again, looking at a church that was ignited. They were on fire for Jesus. Now, as Paul has been wrapping up these final verses of this chapter, he's been referring to the church as a family. In fact, he uses the word brethren five times from verses 12 to the end of the book, emphasizing the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and as a result, we should act like that. Unfortunately, that's not an easy task, because just as our own siblings within a family don't always get along, we don't always get along as well. Uh, Someone humorously uh, wrote that every church has members of the Tate family in it. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, here it is. Every church has people in it like old man dictate. He just wants to run everything. Then there's Uncle Rotate. He likes to change everything. There's Sister Agitate. She's always stirring up trouble in the church. And she adds this with her husband, Irritate. And whenever new products are suggested to the church, Old Hesitate and his wife, Vegetate, don't want to do anything like that. While, on the other hand, there's Aunt Imitate. She wants our church just to be like every church she's ever gone to. Then there's Devastate, always there to pronounce the voice of doom for any new project. It'll never work, you know. And then, of course, there's the black sheep of the family, Amputate. He's completely cut himself off from the family. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, we're, not, we're an imperfect family, right? But we are part of the family of God, and that's the good things. And God wants us to activate our love for one another. So as Paul ends this book, he's, he's giving us nine spiritual directives to help us in our walk. Now, uh, we took a break for Easter, but prior to that, we saw two other studies. We looked at uh, the first nine, or I'm sorry, the first six principles. And the first three, they came in, came in clumps, the first three, we talked about respecting leadership, we talked about loving one another, we talked about not seeking revenge, And then in our last study, the next three, we talked about being joyful, being prayerful, being thankful, and that was good. Well, today we look at the last three, and again, how we should conduct ourselves within the family of God. We're going to look at a balance of the Holy Spirit, we're going to look at the basis of prophecy, and then the blessing of discernment. First of all, the balance of the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 19. He says, do not quench the spirit. The word quench means to extinguish, to douse, or to put out, right? The picture here is putting out a fire. Don't quench the spirit. The spirit is referred to as a fire, and of course, we see that in the scripture. In fact, if you have an NIV, it translates this verse, do not put out the spirit's fire. You know, fire speaks of quite a few things. First of all, it speaks of purity, right? Precious metals are refined in the fire, And the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in order to make us pure. Fire also speaks of warmth. In John chapter 14, we're told that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. How encouraging is that how the Holy Spirit with us and in us. But also, uh, fire speaks of light. And we're told in John 15 that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to lead us into truth. In other words, he's going to guide us like a light out of darkness. Fourthly, I would say say that fire uh, speaks of power. And over and over again, the scriptures were told to not trust in our strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And then finally, I would say that fire speaks of judgment. And we're told in John chapter 16 and verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So think about this. When the Holy Spirit is in work in our lives, we're experiencing these things. God, uh, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that he, he gives purity to our lives, conviction of sin. He guides us into truth. So when Paul says, don't quench the Spirit, certainly he's talking about that. Don't quench that work of the Holy Spirit in your life. We, we need to also add the fact that the Holy Spirit produces fruit in our life, right? And we've talked about this in many studies in Galatians 5.22. We're told that the fruit of the Spirit in the believer's life is love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Certainly, uh, Paul is talking about that. Don't quench that in your life. In fact, you, you need that to flourish in your life. There's also another aspect of the Holy Spirit, and that's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7 says, every single one of you have been gifted by God. And he gives a list there in that passage. Certainly that's included when he talks about not quenching the Spirit, putting it out. So let's talk about then quenching the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? Well, there are essentially two ways that you and I as Christians and the church as a whole can quench the Holy Spirit. The first is what I call the bucket of water approach. The bucket of water approach. In other words, as soon as you hear about the Holy Spirit at work, let's put a bucket of water on that and stop that immediately. I mean, that can't be of God, right? Don't bother to investigate it to see if it's from the Lord. Just put it out. Why? Because I'm not comfortable with it. I don't believe God is working today like he did in the early church. And we have a name for these people uh, doctrinally. They're called cessationists. They believe that all supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit evidenced in the New Testament have ceased. So they are absolutely close to the work of the Holy Spirit. Certainly, Paul could be referring to that when he's talking about not quenching the Spirit because he goes on to say, don't despise prophecies. But you know, there are people within the body of Christ today that as soon as you start talking about the Holy Spirit, they clam up, they shut up, and they won't open up to the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'll be honest, that, that's who I used to be. I used to be that early on in my walk with the Lord. And the reason why people are like that and why I was like that is because of all the crazy stuff you see happening in the body of Christ. And the thought of some people is, if that's the Holy Spirit, well, I don't want anything to do with that. that that's crazy, right? I don't want that. Well, if you find yourself in that category, let me say this. This is so important. You never need to be afraid of a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. Never. You never need to be afraid of a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you ought to be afraid of actually stopping a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. So there's, first of all, the bucket of water. You know, to quench means to doubt. So we got to put that thing out. Stop it immediately. On the other hand, there's what I call the bucket of gasoline approach. And that, too, is quenching the Holy Spirit. In other words, you hear something, little thing that the Holy Spirit is doing. Let's get some gasoline on that thing. <laughs> Let's get it going. Woo! Right? Let us get it going, ladies and gentlemen, right? So they're at the opposite of stream of the cessationists. We would call them sensationalists, right? They're looking for the extraordinary. They're looking for the unusual. And instead of putting out everything without investigating it, they accept everything without investigating it, right? That, too, is quenching the Holy Spirit, right? Right? This was the problem of the Corinthian church. Paul wrote two letters to the church of Corinth. Combined, that is a lot of verbiage to one church. And here's the thing. Paul says, you are, you are the most gifted church I've ever went, uh, you know, written to. Yet, at the same time, they were the most carnal church he had ever written to. They were out of balance. In chapter 12, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. Why? Because that was exactly their problem. So he spent three chapters, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, uh, trying to get them back into balance. In uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, we're told we shouldn't believe every spirit, but we need to test the spirits to make sure it's from God. That's sound advice. So here's the thing. We shouldn't dismiss everything automatically, but neither should we accept everything automatically unless it is first Test it. And what do we test it against, ladies and gentlemen? 
We, we test it against the scriptures. The scripture is our plumb line. It's our compass. So let me give an example in this regard. You've probably all at least seen on television or maybe you were part of a church or maybe you even had a personal experience in what is what we call being slain in the spirit. You know what that is, right? That's when the pastor has some people come up. Oh, look, we got some Bibles here. I didn't know we had this. Awesome. So anyway, these people come up and, and the pastor puts his hands on them and boom, there they go. They fall down. They've been slain in the spirit, right? Sometimes I think they're pushing them pretty hard. You're going there. You know, kind of. Now maybe... Just maybe you even experienced that. I want to tell you something. I will not argue. I will not argue the fact that you even had an experience. I won't argue the fact that someone maybe had an experience. The question is, my friends, where does that square with Scripture? Where do we find that in the Scriptures? The fact is, we don't. Now, we do have uh, the guards coming out to arrest Jesus when he was in the garden. And, they said, and he asked them, who are you seeking? They said, Jesus, he said, I am. He, he expressed the very name of God, and he is God, and they all fell down. Now, that's expressing deity. That's something completely different, right? Listen, the only time we have someone in the early church being slain in the spirit is in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. It actually uses that terminology. They were slain in the spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't want that. They died. They died. We also don't find the Apostle Paul or any of the church leaders when they're writing the letters to the church saying, hey, make sure you're reading the scriptures, make sure you're preaching Christ, make sure you're having communion, you're baptizing people. We have that, but nowhere do we have. Now make sure you have people slain in the spirit. It's it's nowhere. It doesn't fit the context anywhere at all. See, the problem is this. Once you start dictating what is of the spirit and what is not of the spirit based on experience, then you open up Pandora's box, you see? Because my experience is going to be different from your experience, is going to be different from your experience, and experience is subjective. And this is where people come up with all kinds of crazy doctrines. So what does Paul say? He says, don't, don't quench the spirit. Don't pour water on everything that you think is the Holy Spirit because you, just, it's, you need to check it out. Don't pour water on it, but neither should you pour gasoline on it and just accept everything. In other words, use the scriptures. And, of course, this is really the real theme of this passage. You're going to see that. So he talks about a balance of the Holy Spirit. Moving on, he talks about the basis or the balance of prophecy. Look at verse 20. And do not despise prophecies. The word despise means to treat with contempt or to reject. Now, what is Paul talking about when he talks about prophecy? Is he saying uh, we shouldn't reject the second coming of Jesus Christ? He could be. Because we know in chapter 4, he talked about the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. That was good stuff. Hey, that's reality. Don't reject that. Certainly. Most likely, though, he's referring to the gift of prophecy or a prophet. And, of course, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in great detail, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, the word prophecy simply means to speak forth. In a biblical context, it means to speak forth the word of God. The term a prophet, prophetia, is the Greek word, and it means one who speaks for God. But here's what we need to understand. This is very important to your understanding of what you find in the scriptures. There are two types of prophecy. First of all, there's the one we usually think of first, and that's predictive prophecy, what we might call uh, foretelling, foretelling the future, right? And we have that in the scriptures, We have that in the Old Testament. We have Moses and Daniel and Isaiah uh, speaking forth scriptures foretelling the future about the Messiah. We even have it in the New Testament. In fact, in the book of Acts, we read of a gentleman by the name of Agabus who predicted the future, and those things came to pass. However, prophecy doesn't always mean foretelling. In fact, its predominant use in the scriptures is forthtelling. In other words, it's, it's proclaiming to the people what God has already revealed in his word. Hey, this is what you find predominantly. I've, I've taught through the Old Testament. It's, it's there. You have prophets, and what they're doing is they're calling kings and nations to live out what God has already stated in his word. We've fallen. We've fallen away from God's word. We need to start living it. So they're calling people to live out what is already revealed. 
Suffice to say, that is the primary role of a prophet. I've shared with you many times before, I think of Billy Graham. We would say Billy Graham, definitely the gift of evangelist. He is an evangelist. But I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, he is also a prophet. He has been one who for six decades has been calling uh, our nation to return to God. That is what a prophet does. That's the office of a prophet. Now, can God speak through individuals today to predict the future? Of course, of course. In fact, Paul says here, don't despise prophecies. However, just in regard to not quenching the spirit, there has to be a balance. In other words, these prophecies must be tested. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 29, it says, if a prophet speaks, he must be judged. How about that? Oh, we don't like that word in our society. Oh, don't judge me. It's like one of these big words everybody likes to bring up. It's like the one word verse. Most people, if you go back several generations, the one verse they knew in the Bible was John 3.16. Today they know, hey, judge not, lest you be judged. That's the one they know, right? So we're told in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, though, that they need to be judged. In other words, is it from God? So someone says, I've got a predictive prophecy. Well, first of all, let me say this, ladies and gentlemen. The canon of Scripture is closed. God is not revealing any new truth to us other than what's in the Scriptures, So if someone says, I just want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, in the last days, all we're going to do is have peace. There's never going to be any tribulation. We're not going to get worse. It's all going to get better. That sounds like a politician, right? (laughs) But if a prophet says that, you can reject him because that's not what the scriptures tell us. Scriptures tell us we're moving into a time where it'll be a time of tribulation. Of course, Jesus will rapture his church, but there will be tribulation. It's called a day of woe when Jesus comes in his second coming. Or if someone says, hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is returning to earth October 27th, 2016. Well, then you can reject that guy as well. Why? Mark 13, 32, Jesus said, no one knows the hour, not the angels in heaven, nor even the Son of Man, only the Father. So the moment a person puts a date on the coming of Christ, they're wrong, right? They're a loony. They're off. Reject them. Don't hang with them. Turn off the channel, turn off the radio, whatever you got to do, you know. Now, should we be open? Yes, yes, but we have to test it with God's word. In fact, let me tell you how serious this is. Because what happens, because there are people, by the way, that have labeled themselves prophets. It's kind of amazing to me. I've been around long enough now to follow uh, people in ministries, in multiple ministries globally for many years. It's just, you know, part of, hey, what I do, you know. And I've seen people that are one-time pastors, and all of a sudden, somewhere down the line, they became a bishop, and now they're called prophet so-and-so. And I'm like, well, where did they get that title all of a sudden? They gave it to themselves is what they did. Or a group of other people that called themselves prophets said, now you're a prophet. That's how they got that title. And they treat it so uh, loose. And they make all kinds of prophecies. Well, how do you judge a prophet? Well, let me say this. Not only does it line up with God's word, but 100% of what they say must come to pass. Listen, when it comes to prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, it is not a 60-40 thing. It's not a 90-10 thing. It's a 100% thing. And if one thing they say doesn't come to pass, they are a false prophet. That's how they're to be labeled. Listen, because of that, when you look at the prophets called by God, Do you realize that when God called them into ministry, they were usually very tentative? Not me, Lord. Oh, Lord, can I do such a thing? Not me, Lord. Why? Because they learned, they understood the seriousness of it. Deuteronomy 18, 20, God says, if a prophet presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, that prophet will die. Well, that's pretty radical. Yet there's this casual approach to these guys that say, well, I'm a prophet of God, you know. It's serious business. So he's not saying reject everything, but you better test it according to God's word. So we see the balance there, the balance of the Holy Spirit, the balance of judging things that are taught. And that leads us really to the third part, the third thing we want to look at today, and we'll spend the lion's share here, and that's the importance or the blessing of discernment. Because really, this is tying together what we've looked at in verses 21 and 22. He says this, test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. 
That word test there in verse 21 means to evaluate, to distinguish, to judge. Paul is saying, make judgments. And when you do, as you do, when you find something that is good, hold fast to that which is good. By the way, that word good there is kalos. And and it doesn't necessarily mean that which is outwardly good, though in many cases it can be, but it speaks of something that is intrinsically good. And so he's saying we are to distinguish and find that which is internally good, that which is spiritual, that which is biblical, that which is right. Hold fast to that. Embrace it. However, verse 22, abstain or shun, turn away from every form of evil. And that word there, evil, better translated malignant. Anything that is cancerous, anything that is going to cause something uh, harm and death, stay away from it. So this is a call to discernment. Now discernment is simply distinguishing what is truth from error. By the way, did you know that we exercise discernment every single day? By the way, did you know that you make judgments every single day? That's what I find so funny when people say, don't judge, don't judge. I'm like, you do it all the time. Oh, no, I don't. I don't judge anything. Oh, yes, you do. If you're, you know, if you're a guy and you go out and you're going to barbecue, did you know when you go pick out the meat you're going to barbecue, you're making a judgment, you're being discerning. You see something rotting there that's been left there in the butcher's thing, you're not going to use that, right? You want the fresh meat, you want the good meat. Ladies, when you're going and you're picking your veggies and your fruit, what are you doing it? You're squeezing it. You're moving around. You're being discerning. That's mushy. That's no good, right? You're being discerning. You're, you're making a judgment, when you pick your doctor, did, you, did any of you just like, when you want to pick a doctor, just do throw through the yellow pages, put your finger down like that? Oh, that's a good doctor. I'll use them. No, you didn't. You wanted some referral. You wanted to know something about them. You want a recommendation, right? I mean, you're just not going to have anybody cut you open, right? I hope not. Don't do that. Be discerning, right? So here's the thing. If we are discerning in physical things, how much more in spiritual things, right? Let me give you a couple of reasons why I think this is not happening in the church today. Because if you didn't know that, not only is it not happening in the world, it's definitely not happening in the church today. It's one of the things we really lack. That's discernment. Why is that? Number one, I would say there's, because there's a lack of doctrinal clarity. There's a lack of doctrinal clarity. What has entered into the church is what has been in the world for some time now. And it's that big giant word, the T word, tolerance. Man, we got to be tolerant. Oh, don't say anything about that. Oh, don't. You got to be politically correct. You got to be tolerant. Well, of course, there's a place for tolerance in the body of Christ to love one another, of course. But one area you don't want to be tolerant, and that's in doctrine. You don't want to be tolerant in doctrine. In other words, what is taught in the scriptures. Yet today in the church, you have people saying, well, same-sex marriage, that's cool. I'm pretty sure we can find that in the Bible. And if it says something against it, we'll just say that's not what it says. That, no, it doesn't mean that. So we just make up stuff, you know. In fact, I've actually heard people say, it's crazy. There's, you know what the problem in the church is today? There's just too much doctrine. <laughs> I, I, I laugh at that. Too much doctrine. You know what the word means? And it sounds big. The word, the word doctrine means right teaching. Yeah, there's just too much right teaching in the church today. We got to get rid of that right teaching stuff. We got to have bad teaching. That's what we need. We need people to tell us the wrong thing so we all feel good about ourselves. That's what we need. And, and so this leads to a lack of discernment. Another contributor to a lack of discernment is an unhealthy desire for unity. An unhealthy desire for unity. Now, of course, we want to have unity. We're brothers and sisters, right? In Christ. It's not always easy to get along because we have so many quirky things about ourselves, right? And Jesus even prayed in John 17 that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one. The Lord wants that. But he doesn't want, though, a unity at any cost. That's worldly. And yet that has seeped into the church today. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint, who is making his way through the book of 1 Thessalonians. In this letter, the Apostle Paul teaches the early Christians to live holy and blameless lives by being sexually pure. Back in those days of Roman influence, much like it is in our culture today, people freely indulge their sexual desires. In such a culture, one of the most powerful ways Christians can display the holiness of God is to abide by God's design for sex, which is between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage. 
we encourage you to reflect God's holiness in this way. If you have any questions or prayer requests, we'd love to hear from you and pray with you. Please reach out to us at 281-648-5800. Again, that number is 281-648-5800. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. If you're in the Houston area, why don't you join us in person? You can find our location and service times at ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app as well. The Larger Than Life podcast is available to stream from the podcast link, or you can subscribe from your favorite app so you never miss an episode. We hope you'll join us next time for another message from Larger Than Life.